Wayne's teaching. I ran out of time. Somebody out before you says, what do you mean there's a time, you know? We're not, you don't have a set time. Uh, yeah, you do. You, you can tell when people have left. <laughs> They're still here physically. They're off somewhere else. Yeah. It was time. That was enough. But uh, <laughs> I am really glad that we have, uh, the camera might want to get a shot of this. I don't know. We, we did have a few women that hearkened to the message, and we have them wearing their head coverings tonight. Here's, here's, a, here's Pamela, you know, wearing a head covering. We have Marvina and uh, Mary here in the back. And so, oh, oh, now we have Deborah over here. She's, she's got her head covering on. See, and, and so I just, oh, who else do we have back here? Oh, oh, and right here, well, he's too close. He can't get the camera, but there she is with another head coat covering. So. <laughs> okay. See, people are listening. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> well, go to Galatians 5 again. Let's look at, the, I want to finish up on marriage. There's a few, marriage. I want to finish up on this word uh, witchcraft. Uh, there was a, I, I just ran out of time. There was some really good points that I didn't get to bring out. Again, uh, Hebrews won't work. Galatians, <laughs> Galatians here. This is the only place in the New Testament where the word witchcraft, that particular English word, is used. There, there are a few other places where the word like uh, "Who has bewitched you?" over in the same book. Uh, in Galatians but again in the context there the writer is not talking about any form of bubble bubble toil and trouble uh, eye of Newton any kind of witchcraft in the sense that we think of witchcraft he's really talking about the Judaizers who came in and used the word the word of God basically to bewitch their minds if you let me say it that way he's going what has happened to you I came in I told you the truth and it's like somebody's cast a spell on you. Well, they didn't cast a spell. They came in and they taught wrong doctrine. They taught wrong doctrine. But this word witchcraft itself only occurs once in the New Testament. This is it. It's listed as a work of the flesh. And to be honest with you, I never had studied it out. And I always, I just kind of, you know, you read through there and all those other ones, hatred, and emulations, I can easily see how those were works of the flesh. Witchcraft, in my mind, would kind of just, what? Now just go on. So when I looked it up and found out it was the Greek word pharmakia, which, uh, let me read Rick Renner's first paragraph here. He says, Paul lists this as one of the works of the flesh. The word witchcraft is from the Greek word pharmakia, the Greek word for medicines, or drugs that inhibit a person's personality or change his behavior. We would call these mind-altering drugs. The Greek word pharmakia is where we get the words uh, in, in English, pharmaceutical drugs or the word pharmacy. This word was used in connection with sorcery, magic, or witchcraft. By, by <clears throat> but why was this word used in connection with witchcraft? And why would Paul use this word to depict the works of the flesh? And as long as my mind had that mental image of bubble, bubble, toil, and trouble, you know, witches around a boiling pot and all of this and casting spells. It didn't make any sense to me. But once I saw what it really was, and I read it this morning, that portion, in ancient times, they used it as a form of, uh, to re alleviate your pain. You know, we still do that today with morphine. If, you know, thank God. I mean, I thank God there are drugs like that, that <clears throat> if you're in a serious wreck and they've got a, you know, they're going to saw your leg off. How many of you are glad there's a little bit of morphine, you know, some morphine or something to, to help with that, okay? But uh, the problem is using drugs as, a, as an escape me mechanism. And that's, that's, in our culture, that is rampant. Not just with, you know, what we normally think of as the, quote, bad drugs, you know, heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine and all those kind of things. But people use them. I used it, alcohol, I used it to uh, <laughs> diminish the pain, uh, however you want to put it, put me into a, it just put me in a mode where I could, I could function in the job that I did pretty well. And then you all know I did uh, cigarettes for years. Well, cigarettes are just, uh, uh, you know, they calm you down. They calm you down. So, uh, you know, for years I relied on both of those things. So when I was first reading this, I thought, oh, Carrie, you've done a pretty good job. You're no more reliant on those things anymore to escape. And I had a vision of my television. 
<laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> then someone in the, hall, in the foyer says, you know, you didn't even mention our electronic devices today, our iPads and our iPhones. And you, at a restaurant now, if you just notice, you look around and people, people used to sit and talk. Now you watch, it's amazing how many people, one person is there and the, the other person is on their phone and doing things. And, and uh, it's very, you know, we use, it, it's very much an alternate reality, okay? Anything that you're doing that causes you uh, to not confront the flesh. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's bring it home. What, what, what do we teach here? We teach transformation to the image of Christ by means of what we call the message. Praying in other tongues, meditation of the word, confession of the word, fasting, worship, all of the assimilation, all of the things we teach here. The idea is the transformation of the soul primarily I mean, God did in your spirit what man could not do. He has already quickened that old spirit in you from death to life. You are a new creature on the inside. God did what man could not do. But he is leaving it up to us for this transformation of the soul. When I say us, it's up to us how much time we spend with the Holy Spirit to allow him to renew our mind. And it's really more than just increased knowledge or accurate knowledge he also in that process is changes your heart he changes your value system he changes uh, like mark said this morning where you love people more than you love your own money honey that's a big one <laughs> that's a big one there you know it's, you know especially if that guy's a sinner you know and you're going to love him and he's walking off with your fifty thousand dollars and you're going to love him Truly, genuinely, from your heart, more than your money that he's walking off with. In our culture, we're talking Red Sea Miracle time. But what happens in that process, the, the downside or the, what comes along, I mean, doesn't that part sound wonderful? Don't you wish there was no problems with that? Just walk into God? Problem is, is along that path, you meet yourself about every third step. You pray, and the idea is to change anything in you that is not like Jesus. So, great. You start praying, and you kind of thought you're a little bit okay. I'm not looking at anyone in particular now. Don't, don't read it. i got to look somewhere. You think you're okay. <laughs> now, every, every person on the, oh, God. <laughs> and then you pray, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, he shines that flashlight, and now there's something really ugly in you that's not like Jesus. And he says, now you're going to have to deal with that. And you're going, I'm not like that. No, I'm not like that. You go asking all your friends, all of us that's known you, I'm not like that, am I? And we're all going, yeah, kind of you are, yeah. <laughs> of course, if you get mad at that, we got another issue. But anyway. <laughs> and the trouble is you keep meeting yourself. And, you know, I've, I, I've been here a long time. I'm telling you, now don't ask me how I know this. Sometimes you deal with them right away. Sometimes you deal with them. It takes a long time to deal with. Sometimes you don't want to deal with them. Or you try and deal, deal with it, and it's too painful. And so then the idea is, this is where Dave says, one of two things is going to happen. You are either going to deal with it and continue in prayer, or you're going to drop out of prayer and do something else. Because one thing about it, the Holy Spirit, he has a long memory. He never forgets anything. Don't ask me how I know this. You can drop out of prayer for months. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> and think, okay, he's probably forgot about it now. I need to get back in prayer. You won't be praying five minutes. You're going to come square up to that same thing again right there. Because that's the next thing on your journey that's got to be dealt with. Well, now that's where the uh, anything to avoid... We use the term impasse. In this article, he uses the word confrontation. What you're talking about is a confrontation. How did Michael say that? A showdown at the flesh corral. <laughs> it's you and the flesh have showed up. You both got your six guns. We're going to have a showdown here, and we're going to see who's going to win, you know. So he says, let me find this one paragraph. People who refuse to look at themselves and find out what needs to change they often develop chemical dependencies in their efforts to avoid seeing the truth. The flesh hates confrontation. It doesn't want to look into the mirror. 
to see the truth. If the flesh is confronted and forced to look squarely at itself, it will have to acknowledge the real problem. That's when you, that's an impasse right there. Rather than look the fact squarely in the face, face, the flesh tries to run, to hide, to sleep. Any of y'all ever been? I have been. I'll just, I'll admit, I'll tell you. I have, in my lifetime, I have had periods of depression where all I wanted to do was sleep. I hate to admit that. Admit, I hate to admit that, not admin that. I hate to admit that. <laughs> but it's true. I have, they were short spells, but I didn't even want to, I didn't want to wake up. Because when I wake up, I couldn't not think about whatever problem it was. But sweet, glorious sleep, you know, I could sleep and escape, okay? I'm getting a few nods here. I'm not the only, you know, leave crazy alone. I'm not, <laughs> not the only crazy one here. Or, but that's right. The flesh wants to, to, to run, to hide, to sleep, to consume itself with recreational activity. I've, I've met people like that. They have got to have every minute of every day scheduled up. I mean, one, you know, all day, all day, all day. And they, that, that way they have no time to think. No time to pray. No time to, you know, no, no, I'm just too busy. Yeah. So anything to stay busy to keep from slowing down long enough to think about vital issues. In other words, the flesh would rather try to learn how, excuse me, the flesh would rather try to learn how to cope with the problem than to be crucified and changed. Okay. Well, what will you do then? Are you going to be like the heathen worshiper? Like a, the one in the like he describes in ancient times, who kept going from place to place, trying to find another temporary solution. Or are you going to let the Spirit of God deal with you, and change you forever? The Holy Spirit wants to identify the root of the problem, and rip that ugly thing clear out of your soul. Amen. He wants to bring permanent change to your life. But for you to receive this soul-cleansing work of God, you, and here's where, you will have to make your flesh shut up and move out of the way. Now, that's what people don't like. I didn't like it. Uh, I mean, I kept trying. I'll use one of my, it's an easy one to teach on the smoking. I mean, that's an easy one. Obviously, a work of the flesh. Like Dave says, it won't send you to hell, just make you smell like you've been there. Unless Sue keeps spraying you with Febreze. And, uh, boy, she did. And my ears would drip with the stuff. But Eventually, once I had that, but I kept praying. See, and that's what Dave keeps saying. He says, God will walk through hell with you. He, I mean, let's face it. He, he already has. Any of you that's been here more than a year, and you've actually been doing the message, you know he loved you when you came, right? Usually about one year is where you go, I'm, I'm ugly, I'm no good, he hates me, I know I'm bad, I don't pray, I don't fast, I don't this, I don't that. And what's happened, you've just prayed enough to get your first glimpse of yourself. And you, you don't realize at that moment, now, wait a minute, he loved you when you came here. <laughs> and you had all of those same faults then. You were just oblivious. The rest of us weren't. <laughs> <laughs> we can see it. <laughs> but you are happy and oblivious. I'm okay. He loves me. And we're all going, we'll see what happens after prayer. <laughs> so then after, after a while, you know, all of a sudden you're, you get your first real look. You know, the, the spotlight shines. You go, oh, I'm not like that, am I, Johnny? Johnny, I'm... Yes, Gary, you're like, oh, no. T Doug, tell me it's not so. It's so. Oh, <laughs> now you... You know, now, what are you going to do? See, because it, now you, you've still got to conquer that thing. Well, with me with the cigarettes, I would try. I mean, I did try a hundred, at least a hundred times, more than that over all those years, trying to quit. What would happen, the withdrawals. Now, here's the body going. See, it sounds so easy. Well, just stop it. Mm -hmm. Well, the body says, try that. We'll see how that works for you. <laughs> I mean, the withdrawals would get so bad for me, and I was trying to be nice. I remember one time I really tried to quit many, many, many in a galaxy far away, <laughs> long, long time ago. Seems like that now. Many, many years ago, and on the seventh day of me trying to quit, Aaron went and bought me some cigarettes. Our daughter, Aaron, says, Daddy, nobody can live with you. Here, have these. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
Rosalie says to Dave sometimes, he says, I'm going to go on a fast. And she says, can you fast somewhere else? <laughs> and as sweet as Dave is. So we've all got stuff. Now, the point of it is, I kept praying, though. And I thank God for a pastor who kept, kept on. He, he saved my life I don't know how many times. It's where this, our famous line comes from. Better is a creep that prays than a creep that doesn't pray. He says, I don't care how bad it is and how many times you fail, God will walk through hell with you as long as you don't start justifying it, saying it's not sin when you know it is, and as long as you don't say all the time, I can't get free. I, I faltered there a little bit, but still, I kept praying, I kept praying, I kept praying, and sure enough, one day, it brought me to that place uh, up in New York where I had a vision. But, you know, whether it was, I, I mean... It was strong. It was just as real to me, just as real as me being right here. And the Lord had, you know, he just showed me. He says, you're going to come to heaven even if you don't deal with this thing. You, you've got a reward. And you know, and I ha you and I have a good relationship, and we did. You know, I'd pray, and he'd talk with me. And he says, but if you don't deal with this, he said, there's places, it's, it's, it's my mind, I want to send you, where I can't send you as long as you have this problem in the flesh. They won't receive anything you have to say. And he says, you're going to have to deal with it. Well, that vision, it didn't change the withdrawals. See, that, I mean, that very day, I, I never smoked another one after that vision. I went through hell. I got to tell you, it did not diminish the withdrawals. I still had to do exactly, and all of that is to talk about this. You have to tell your flesh to shut up and move out of the way. Well, I told it, and it talked right back to me. <laughs> I mean, the withdrawals were tough. And I'm using that one because it's easy to teach on. It's whatever it is with you. With some people, it's gossip. With some people, it's money. With some people, it's God only knows what strongholds, you know, self-exaltation, anything in the world, love, just all kinds of things. But whatever it is, now the flesh is not just going to lay down and be nice. You're going to probably go through some difficulty. Well, he'll help you. The point is... By I know it's because I kept on praying, kept on doing the message. That's what generated finally that vision. And when he, when he did that part about, I'm going to have to draw back a curtain when you get here and show you all of the things that it was my plan for you to do that you never did because you refused to deal with that in the flesh. The pain that was associated with that emotion because I felt it strong. I said, man, I'm going to have to stand there one day. I'm going to have to give account. That pain was stronger than the withdrawal pain. And it got me through. It took a long time. Haven't had one. I was so glad when it got to be two years. So I didn't have to say, how long, how long does it go? You know, how many years ago did you quit? It's hard to say a year. <laughs> after two years, boy, I mean, right after that second anniversary, I went, oh, it's been years. <laughs> well, now it's been many years. I can add, it's been a long time now. Never smoked another one. Do I never will either. It's just like, uh, you know what, never had another drink since 1980, you know. I, I, and, I, and I'm the one that teaches you can have wine in moderation. You can. It says you can. Just don't be drunk on wine. But I'm not doing it for any other reason. I'm a teetotaler myself, and I plan to stay that way. Okay. All right, well, let me finish this up here. And he says, but you, let's see. The Holy Spirit wants to identify the root of the problem and rip that ugly thing clear out of your soul. He wants to bring permanent change to your life. Oh, and I thank God for that. It's so nice now. I, I mean, I, I've been free for a long time now. I mean, it was difficult at first. People would walk by on the sidewalk smoking a cigarette. I'd want to turn around and follow them. Now, I can't believe I ever smoked the nasty things. I mean, the smell of it just is offensive to me, you know. Ugh, I'm so glad Sue quit too, you know. You know, I kiss Sue a lot, and it's like licking an ashtray. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, thank God. <laughs> Got a lady over here. She's going, did he say that in church? He didn't say that in church. I mean. <laughs> it's wonderful to see permanent change, and that's really what we're after. But now, smoking is a minor thing. What I want is to have that permanent change where I love that sinner more than my money. I talked last time, I think, about the tombstone. I want my own tombstone. I want, a tomb, I want the Holy Ghost to proclaim a tombstone that Gary Carpenter is dead to money. And I mean dead to it. Where it's just a tool, 
You know, I don't love a wrench. I thank God for a wrench when I need that tool for my... my, my. Actually, now I believe God for men who have wrenches. But <laughs> anyway, at my age now, I'd just hire somebody. You know, we don't, most of us don't have a love affair. With, I guess some guys do, but a love affair with a wrench. But in God's eyes, tool, God's eyes, money is a tool just like that. That's all it really is. It's just a tool. It's a shame that we have such a love affair with it. Getting back to this. But for you to receive this soul-cleansing work of God, you will have to make your flesh shut up and move out of the way. And after you tell the flesh to be silent, then you're going to have to allow God to speak truthfully to you. And this will, this will demand that you spend time looking into the mirror of God's Word so you can see what is wrong and what needs to be changed. Now, if Dave was writing this article, or I was writing it right here, I would, that's all true. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But I would add we have a helper to help us with that process. I would read the Word, let, the whole, you know, let it show you the truth, but then we have a helper who has been called alongside to help. Romans uh, 8.26 who also helps us with our infirmities, the weaknesses of our flesh, and that's the Holy Spirit. And he'll, he'll help you through that process. But ultimately, if this statement is true, you are going to have to hold yourself above as the master of your flesh and confront that thing, keep on praying, keep on confessing, and putting up with the withdrawals or whatever it is until you come out on the other side. And that's what people don't like. That's why the church is not any, you know, we don't have more attendance than we do. This is not an easy message. It's a whole lot easier. There's a lot of churches in town where you're okay and you'll be okay and you'll always be okay. And there's truth to that. He does love you. He will love you. He'll always love you. But that doesn't mean you're okay. <laughs> it, it means he's okay. <laughs> See? But if you're really wanting to change, this is the only path. So he says, if you're willing to do this, God's spirit will set you free. Amen. Amen, he will. Yes, your flesh will scream in pain. But when it does, take authority over it and tell it to be silent. And I would say, I would add, continue to pray. Continue to confess God's word. It is screaming because it knows that it's losing the power it has always exercised in your life. So for our purposes in today's world, the word witchcraft from the Greek word pharmakia, would refer to the flesh's attempt to avoid being confronted and changed. In fact, the flesh would rather be told a lie than confronted with the truth. It wants someone to stroke it and to assure it, quote, you don't need to change. Here, let me make you feel better. Just ignore those wrong things in your life. Because if you ignore them long enough, They'll somehow just go away. End of quote. Doesn't that just sound like someone on drugs? <laughs> now that's a good article. See, and that makes sense. That now, now, quote, witchcraft, which really is pharmakia, which is really the use of anything to cause your mind an escape mechanism from doing the message or confronting wrong things in our life. That's really pharmakia. And that is a work of the flesh, and that makes sense to me. See, because everything else in that list is self-induced. Nobody commits adultery for you. Nobody fornicates for you. Nobody hates for you. Nobody envies for you. Every one of those lists of the flesh are self-initiated, except witchcraft. And witchcraft was in there in my, in my mind as long as it was some, other, some kind of witch out there casting a curse on you. I say, well, wait a minute, what's this? That's somebody else's flesh. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> they don't have authority over me. But see, now that I understand it, it's every time I choose. Uh, yes, sir. That's okay. <laughs> every, every time I choose anything that would allow me to escape the problem rather than confront the problem, that's pharmakia. In Paul's day, when he, wrote, when he wrote this letter, it was pretty much mind-altering drugs. You do know they didn't have television. <laughs> they didn't have Internet. See, now there's, there's people that spend, I mean, if they can afford it, if they're on welfare or what, if, they're on, if they can afford it, if they don't have to go to a job is what I'm saying. There's people that they'll spend their whole waking hour as an avatar on the Internet, 
being Xena the warrior princess or Hercules or whatever it is, you know. What is Cole's avatar? I forget. He's got an avatar. He's a great big guy on the internet. Cole, you ought to see his avatar. Guy weighs about 260 pounds, and big muscle dude with a sword and a shield, you know. And Cole's this tall. <laughs> Maybe that tall now, you know. Yeah, but it, what that is, that's, a, that's an escape. What does Sue call this? SRA, you know. What is SRA? Well, that is selective reality acceptance. <laughs> this is the reality that I choose. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I hope you all are having fun. One of them that I did not get to today that I want to get to, uh, I just touched on. Sac I've got so much on, at my website about traditions when it comes to giving. You know, the legalistic tithe or any kind of sacrificial giving taught that you've got to do that in order to get God's blessing. That's like Isaiah said, it's the whole head is sick from the top to the bottom. There's no soundness in that doctrine. It's absolutely wrong. It's not like God at all. No parent is like that, you know. Uh, but one of them that I didn't talk on is honoring our Jewish roots. It, within the church, and, I, and I'm all for messianic Jews. I mean, if, if what you mean by that is a person who grew up under the law. It's like, well, like everybody that the book of Hebrews was written to. These are all Jewish people who grew up under the law. Had, Mom and daddy, you're growing up. How do I please God? Will you please God by doing your best to keep the law? And if you don't, if you mess up, then here's the appropriate sacrifice. And so they grow up thinking that's the way you please God. And at that time, it was the way you please God. But then after the resurrection, after the cross and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, well, that whole system changed. So somebody came along and preached the gospel to those people that grew up under that system. And they turned away from trusting the law to trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So this morning we got into entering into his rest and what the real Sabbath is and honoring the Sabbath now is means you're not doing any works to add to your salvation. Okay? You're not doing any works to perfect your salvation. Everything, all of your works, if you want to use the word works, Jesus would call that the fruit of your salvation. Okay? It's fruit appearing on your tree. You give because that's who you are. You love because that's who you are. You help others because that's who you are. You clothe the naked because that's who you are. You're not doing any of that trying to obtain salvation. You're doing all of that as the fruit of salvation. It's because who he, ch he changed you, who you are. That's the fruit that appears on the tree. It's just real easy. And if somebody says they're a Christ Christian and you watch them for 20 years, now the thing, why did he choose trees? He could have used any any parable that he wanted, you know. Why did Jesus particularly use trees, fruit on trees? Trees grow slowly. Tim was telling me about, a, you know, the Brazil nut? The Brazil nut comes from Brazil. <laughs> well, Tim and Dave, you know, he's been down there with Dave a few times. Somebody told him down there that a Brazil, now I haven't looked this up, and if it's wrong, it's Tim's fault. Anyway. <laughs> but he said, he said they told him that a Brazil tree a Brazilian nut tree? Oh, somebody already looking it up on the internet here. I haven't even said it yet. There's somebody already looking it up. See if I'm right or wrong here. It's Tim's fault. He said at least there are some varieties of those nut trees that it takes 70 years for the fruit to produce. I hope it does not take that long with most Christians. <laughs> but I will tell you, my dad used to, he loved to plant fruit trees, and he would plant apple trees and pear trees and and I remember a peach tree in particular. He planted a peach tree. And I remember the first year it went through its cycle. But there wasn't anything, I don't think, that year. The next year, sure enough, it produced some little peaches. They're about as big as a marble, you know. And that's as big as they got that year. They never did get any bigger. But they were peaches, little fuzzy things and all, you know. So I remember I went and got one just curious. Went and got one, pulled it off there. It was harvest time. Took a bite of that thing. That was the bitterest fruit I ever ate in my life. Have y'all ever met any Christians like that? <laughs> now, it doesn't mean, that, excuse me, it doesn't mean they're not a Christian. But it means there, there's not much fruit yet. And the fruit that is there may not be the sweetest fruit you ever found. Okay? So he the point is he purposely chose a tree 
so that we would have long suffering and patience with each other because it takes time for fruit to appear on a tree. It's a perfectly good tree, but it takes a while. All right. Now, getting back to the Hebrew Christians, great pressure come on them. Now, that's not exactly what's happening in our culture. What I see happening in our culture, I, see, I do. I honor Abraham. How many of y'all? I mean, in fact, the more I learn about Abraham, the more impressed I am with the man's faith. He just, uh, I don't, there's no way in the world I would have done what he did. I've already proved it in my own life. I didn't leave. He wanted Abraham to leave her, the Chaldees. God wanted me to leave the trucks. And I went, bet me. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Not till you show me how my bills are going to be paid and, and so forth. Abraham obeyed him. Abraham obeyed him again and again and again. And so I honor Abraham. I honor. I love the types and shadows from the feasts and the festivals and every one of those things. You can do a whole seminar on the shofar. You can do a whole seminar on the prayer cloth. Uh, all of it is full of symbolism, you know, just the pomegranates. I remember one preacher one time did a week-long series on the little pomegranate things on the bottom of the robe, and I went, my God, it's just full of revelation knowledge, all those types and shadows. But what you start seeing today is people, they start, they say, well, I want to, you know, we need to honor our Jewish roots. And so usually what's, and I saw this more prominently in South Africa than I have here, but it's, uh, it's starting here, and it's been starting here for a long time. Well, before we can really praise and have the glory of God really show up, somebody has to blow the shofar. Y'all know what the shofar is? Shofar in the Old Testament was a ram's horn. They gave me one uh, in South Africa, which I have at my house, and, uh, and I keep it. It's a, you know, it's an honor thing. Boy, those things are loud. Now, I, I can blow that rascal, but you better be ready because, I, mean, you're, you're, I mean, that thing is loud. And if you want to do it, I mean, it starts off usually pretty innocent. You know, hey, this is something they did in the Old Testament. We're just honoring our heritage. Let's blow the shofar. Well, fine. But if that goes on for a while to the point that, well, the anointing doesn't come unless you blow the shofar, now you're starting to get in trouble. What, and then I've seen it. I've seen this one. It happened... Uh, in Houston, one of the services I did down there, these people, whole group, the whole, where the service has already started, and then like, I don't know, eight or nine people come in the, come in through the back door, and they come sit down in a row, and every one of them has a prayer shawl over their head. They got a prayer shawl. And I thought, huh. I didn't say anything, you know, but I asked, asked later about it and said, well, that's a group that has splintered off away from the church, they're, and at this point, they're drawing disciples unto themselves, and they've gotten to the point now where unless you have your head covered with that prayer shawl, God's just not going to answer your prayers. Now, here we go again. These are types and shadows. Yeah, take that off of Debbie right there. And <laughs> that prayer shawl. <laughs> types and shadows that were legitimate at the time. When those things first came, God was using them, trying. You know, it says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The whole purpose was to show you you need a Savior. But now what's happening, we may start off honoring, you know, we just want to you know, honor our Jewish roots. But, but what's really happening, they're becoming Judaized. They're starting to become Jewish in their thinking again. And kosher foods is another example. It happens all the time, even in churches now. That doctrine is making a real comeback, believe it or not. And there's one in Dallas that someone sent me a, and they were attending this church, and they watched it evolve from a Christian church, started off pretty innocent, shofars, prayer shawls, uh, then kosher foods, and then finally, animal sacrifice. And now they're looking for the coming Messiah. Now that's bad stuff right there. When tradition becomes religion. It's our, the church, the entire church worldwide is full of it. I'm telling you, it's full of it. Go to Micah. Micah is on page uh, 1258. <laughs> it's okay to use the table of contents. I had to, too. I knew roughly where it was. But the prophet Micah.
We're getting near the end of the Old Testament. A few, a few prophetic books left. And Micah really had a revelation here. Let's pick it up in chapter 6. And I'm, act, I'm after verse 8, but let's back up to verse 6. So Micah 6.6. 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And here's the answer. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love what? Mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. Even under the old covenant, he was not so much about having them obey the law. See, the Pharisees, they got it all wrong. That Pharisee who stood up and prayed with himself. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm not like other men. I'm not like this publican. I'm not like this sinner. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all. Well, he was placing every, all of his hope, everything, his value system before God on his ability to keep the law. And he missed the whole point. It was the sacrifice system. It was the mercy in the sacrifice system that was really the important part of the law. Because God knew when he, first, when he gave it to man, man could not keep it. And if God had not put in the lamb, the, the ability to offer, uh, to offer a sacrifice for your sin, man would have been toast from the beginning. <laughs> so you know. so what, what does God, what was, even under the old covenant, what was he really after? after? To, to do justly, to love mercy, not judgment, and to walk humbly with thy God. You know, he's really... Wouldn't that be something if the church was like that today? To walk uprightly, to, to walk according to the new nature. That's what really, when it says, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. That should be a little S there. That's talking about walking according to the new nature. Now, there is a leadership that comes by the Holy Spirit. But in that passage, he's really talking about if you be led of the Spirit, little S, you're not under the law. Why? Because you have a law on the inside. You watch the law of love. Love does no ill to its neighbor. You will walk justly. You will, love doesn't steal from its neighbor. It doesn't lie to its neighbor. It doesn't lie about its neighbor. It doesn't sleep with the neighbor's wife or husband. Love, if we walk that way, and love mercy. Yeah, that's why I ended today in Romans 14, to read that whole chapter. The very person that wrote all of these things so we'd know the truth, he's basically saying, don't take a sledgehammer and beat him up about it. He says, it's more important to walk in love than to, than to always be proved right. Amen? Amen? So I just want to encourage you tonight now to keep doing the message. But know as we go along, there's going to be other services like this where we may have to knock down some traditions. Do you, do you, you know, I have the, the husband of one wife, I have never heard that taught anywhere else. Everywhere else I've ever been, they always teach it the other way. But I was talking with Sue about it after the service. See, Sue was not raised in church. She said, well, I knew the first time I ever read that. He was talking about you can't put deacons in the church that have multiple wives, you know. And see, it's only religion. Predispos pre religion makes you crazy. <laughs> pre it, it puts predispositions in you. I'm not saying the right word. Uh, Preconceived notions, preconceived notions, so that when you read it, you're not reading it uh, from, from a point of zero. You're reading it from some room they put you in. Oh, well, that's talking about, you, you know, if you've been divorced. Well, it's not talking about that. They're out evangelizing these heathen lands, and, they, you know, polygamy was rampant everywhere. But in this, in this gospel, you got to be, you know, you can't be an elder. This is Deacon Smith. He has four wives. This is Elder Bob. He has ten wives. You know, that's not the way they're going to set up the church, okay? So, hallelujah. So, just know that as we go along, now today we touched, we touched, well, I didn't, I talked about robes. Remember the robes? We didn't even get to pointy hats. <laughs> Y'all ever see those pointy hats? 
Don't you ever watch any of the stuff on TV where they... Oh, God. Okay, we'll get into that another time. I don't want to open that can of worms. Pointy hats, yeah, in the certain churches. And they walk around with... And they walk around with uh, I'm not talking about witches now. Okay, they're thinking about witches' hats, I think. No, I'm talking about the little... And they walk around with the little incense things, you know. You know, that's not pot potpourri in there. They're, they're not trying to make the place smell better. That's, what, that's the Holy Ghost. I mean, oh, yeah, that's, you know... Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's enough for one night. <laughs> I'm telling you, the church is... And then we wonder, why isn't there revival? Oh, my God. You know, it's like, can, can he get us out of the kindergarten? So anyway, just know there's more to come. All right, that's enough for tonight. Now shout about it. Hallelujah! Glory, glory, glory! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory, glory, glory! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, Lord. Glory to God. He keeps bringing this up to me, so... Uh, um, um, how many times has he said recently through prophecy and through the messages, he is coming to the place now where he requires us to believe him? <laughs> you remember him saying? <laughs> I've noticed a trend in the prayer lines. Uh, and if it was newbies, it'd be different. But it's not. And so, uh, you know, when, you're, when you've got a real problem and it's on you and it's bad. Now, let's, take, let's just pick something. Let's, say, let's pick a financial problem. You need $500 and you need it two hours ago. I mean, it's desperate. And maybe something really bad is going to happen. Okay, just that kind of a thing. So you get in a prayer line and maybe I can see the pressure. And that's okay. I mean, you know, there's pressure, okay? And it could, it, we could be anything. It could be healing. It could be a wayward child. I'm trying to just teach. But let's say that you needed, your prayer request was $500. And so when you come and you're in that moment of, disp of uh, distress, well, okay, I see it on your face, and maybe there's been crying and watery eyes, and I don't know what all. I'm not looking at anybody for any reason, you know. But then after, now what if during the prayer line, God says, I want you to meet that need yourself. So I whip out my abundant checkbook, and I say, I tell you what, the Lord said, not only am I going to write you a check for 500, he says just to write you one for 5,000. What's your face going to look like when you're leaving that prayer line? Glory to God. You'll be telling everybody about it. Oh, hallelujah. My need is met because you've got the tangible answer in your hand. But I've noticed I don't see that. And I'm not, and I'm, not I'm telling you, it's, I'm not, and I'm not trying to get you to just act like it either. No, it's more than that. If, if I'm trying to get it, he's, he's trying to get us to make an adjustment in the heart. He heard me. He has answered I believe I receive when we prayed. I got to go tell everybody. My prayer has been answered. And that's before you see it. Okay? Now there is something, that, this is not something that comes automatic to human beings. But it does start coming automatic. I think Jesus was really that way. When he prayed, it was over. He knew the Father had answered. Whether he, would he curse that fig tree? And walked away and it looked no different. What do you think was on the inside of him? That rascal is dead. <laughs> I don't care what it looks like. My, what I say comes to pass. Okay? Well, we're going to... He's, he's, I'm slipping the tongues. He's at the point now. When, you, when we come up here, whether it's me, you, or, any, or even at, at home. I mean, let's, let's, act, let's make an adjustment on the inside. He heard me. That answer is on the way. Amen? Amen? All right. Father, do in them what, you've done in, what you're doing in me. <laughs> Make it real. Make it real. I'm, I'm going to the woodshed over it, and I know better. Say, I know better. I've, taught, I've been at this too long, see? And he's taken me to the woodshed two or three times when I prayed about something in the last little bit, and he went, well, you act like you got it answered. <laughs> going around, you know. You know? Okay, enough of that. All right, that's a whole other deal. Extend your faith towards us. How many of you know Victoria has her miracle? Brandy here. I think this is Brandy. I think Brandy has her miracle. How many know Tommy has his miracle? Amen. 
Father, we just thank you that you've already heard us when we prayed on all of these. These are our most wanted, Lord. We have these pictures of these, and we thank you that, that you heard us when we prayed. We thank you that they re they're a miracle. We received those miracles when we prayed, Lord. And we thank you the whole world will see the manifestation of it in Jesus' name. But, Father, right now we're, we're joining our faith with all these people that have sent in these prayer requests that's in this box. And, Father, there's every kind of prayer, I'm sure, in here from everything from hangnails to divorces to suicide to drug addiction to everything in the world, Father. But, Father, your word tells us that if we pray, if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And that's really all we need to know because your word tells us that our confidence is if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So, Father... We're just rejoicing and so glad we're, we're joining our faith with all of these people and thanking you for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And Father, if a stranger, someone who's, if they send in a prayer request, someone who's not yet born again, they're not in your family, not in the kingdom. Father, if a stranger had enough faith to send a prayer request here, Father, we ask, like Solomon asked in the Old Testament, Lord, answer the prayer of the stranger. Do it in such a unique and unusual way that they'll have to know it was you that answered their prayer so they can know like we already know that you are the only true and living God. Father, we thank you for saturating these cloths. We, we know there's nothing magical or special about the cloth. Father, we thank you, though, for saturating these cloths with the tangible presence and the tangible anointing of your Spirit. Father, our faith is, is that as these cloths are sent to the people that need them, that tangible presence and that tangible, tangible anointing travels with the cloth. When they're laid on the sick, the sick will recover. When they're laid on those that have devils, the devils will come out. Alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. Marriages will be put back together. Wayward children will come to their senses Lord, and they'll return to their parents, and you'll turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and many, many other notable, special miracles like this do you do. Father, you haven't changed at all. You're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts, and you still do these special miracles in our day. Father, we lift up Pastor Dave and, and Alan Taylor, and Father, their families which remained at home. We lift up Rosalie, and they're all in that house, and Christy, and all in the in that house, Lord. Father, again, I... Hmm. Yes, sir. Hmm. Hallelujah, Father. Father, all of the seeds that have been planted in Europe in this last few weeks, Father, I see a picture, I, I see it like the Holy Spirit hovering over those seeds, almost like he brooded over the darkness in Genesis. Every one of those seeds, Lord, the Holy Spirit is brooding and incubating, causing fruition to come. The, Father, I see revival springing forth from every one of those places in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, I'm reminded again now of Jason. I know he recently lost his earthly father. Father, we lift up Jason and Tara, all of their house, Lord, their ministry. Father, we thank you for all of the people on staff at the prayer center, everybody who ministers, everybody who volunteers. Father, everyone that has put their hand to the plow. Father, we declare no weapon formed against any of them will prosper. But everything that they set their hand to do will prosper. In the name of Jesus. Father, Father, I thank you for an influx of finances prior to the conference. It's a family reunion. Father, we thank you that as the parents, we are able to lay up for the children. And Father, we thank you that everything that needs to be done, every expense, there'll be more than enough to do it with an abundance left over in Jesus' name. And then, Father, last but not least, we're faced with another week, Lord. We're going to use all the hours in this next week on something. We're going to use them on, on good things or just things. 
Father, you have many people in this city. Lord, some you've instructed to feed the hungry. Some you've instructed to clothe the naked. Some that your heart beats in them to evangelize. And, and Father, we are permitted and commanded to be involved in all of those things. But Father, you have given an assignment to this church. And that's to go far enough into you to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city. Father, we thank you for helping us in our every decision that we make not to spend too much of our time, too much of our resources, and too much of our energy on good things that are not the God thing that you called us to do. Father, we want to do this. We want to apprehend that for which you apprehended us. We want, we want to stand before you one day after... After years of service in this flaming, blazing revival, and stand before you one day and say, we fought the good fight. We kept the faith. And we finished the race that you laid out in front of us. Father, we thank you for all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody says, Amen.